before you ever have a marketing mix, you should absolutely be doing audience research. Meaning that if you <laughs> go out to your market and you say, well, I, I'm pretty sure that I can reach them via advertisements in search on Google, and maybe I'll run some Facebook ads. You, you are going to spend a tremendous amount of money uh, and you're going to be up against an incredible amount of competition. You're almost certainly going to be overpaying and probably struggling because it's very difficult for new and emerging brands to be successful on those platforms. The Strategic Marketing Show is brought to you by Insights for Professionals, providing access to the latest industry insights from trusted brands, all in a customized, tailored experience. Find out more over at insightsforprofessionals.com. Hey, it's David. How do you determine who your ideal audience is and how to find them? That's what we're going to be discussing today with a man who's dedicated his professional life to helping people do better marketing through his writing, videos, speaking, and his book, Lost and Founder. He's the co-founder and CEO of SparkToro, an audience research tool that shows you the websites your customers visit, the social accounts they follow, and the hashtags they use. Our warm welcome to the Strategic Marketing Show, Rand Fishkin. Thanks for having me, David. Good to be back. Yeah, great to have you on here, Rand. Um, well, you can find Rand over at sparktoro.com. So, Rand, um, where does audience research fit into the overall marketing mix? Yeah, I, I think there's two important places, one a little more important than the other, uh, and that is before you ever have a marketing mix, you should absolutely be doing audience research, meaning that if you... <laughs> go out to your market and you say, well, I, I'm pretty sure that I can reach them via advertisements in search on Google, and maybe I'll run some Facebook ads. You, you are going to spend a tremendous amount of money, uh, and you're going to be up against an incredible amount of competition. You're almost certainly going to be overpaying and probably struggling because it's very difficult for new and emerging brands to be successful on those platforms. If instead you talk to your potential customers and you ask them about the sources that they pay attention to and you run a survey, potentially asking them, hey, what, uh, you know, what sorts of publications do you follow and, and where and what do you consume? And then you look at hopefully, you know, some broad passively collected data, like the kinds of things that SparkToro does, but you could certainly use other tools too. And you get a sense of, oh, these are the podcasts that my target audience listens to. And these are the YouTube channels that they subscribe to. And these are the social accounts that they follow on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. And these are the subreddits that they uh, subscribe to. And these are the publications and websites that they read. All of those, if you have a great idea of what those things are before you go do your targeting, well, gosh, it's, uh, it's, like having binoculars and you know being able to to scope your target rather than just traipsing around the woods. Well, towards the beginning there of your answer, you mentioned Facebook ads. So let's go down that rabbit hole to begin with. So obviously, platforms like Facebook ads, like Google ads, have enormous volumes of data. They are bringing AI into the mix in terms of um, who you're able to target as a brand. So why, as a brand, can't you just trust massive platforms like that for your automated audience research? Why, why do you have to do it yourself? Oh, you, you absolutely can. And I think if you are richer than you are wise, you should probably do that. Because Facebook and Google's business model is essentially to say, hey, David, you've got a great product that you're uh, making a dollar of margin on. We would like 99.99 cents of that. Uh, next year, it'll be 99.999 cents of that. And that's how the big ad platforms right, have incredible margins and have, have sort of dominated the growth of you know, the tech world in the last few years. I think that's why even Apple is now like, gosh, advertising is a really great business. Maybe we should kick out Facebook and, and take that market share for ourselves, uh, which, they're, which they're doing. Uh, and I think that if you have more cents than dollars, then you might consider doing audience research first because you will find a lot of tactics, channels, opportunities where Google and Facebook are not uh, able to extract 
a, a massive chunk of your revenue. And you can do that kind of in two ways, right? One is go direct. So, you know, maybe you're listening to this podcast with David and I, and you're thinking, gosh, I would love to reach people on there. How could I, you know, pitch David and be a, uh, interviewed by him? Or could I sponsor this podcast? Or can I work with David in some other way? Maybe he's got an email newsletter and he can send that out. And right, if you want to reach those audiences, you can go direct. You can do that with, with virtually anything in any field. The second option is that you go into your, you know, Google display network, uh, YouTube advertising account, your Facebook and Instagram ads, and you use the data and intelligence you've gathered from audience research to better target your advertising. I actually, I, I just got an email, I think that was on Friday, from um, an agency, and they were very excited. They were like, hey, we just ran a, a big test where, you know, we, we did all our SparkToro audience research, and we ran a bunch of uh, social media advertising campaigns, and the one where we did the targeting based on, you know, what your, what your data told us uh, had, was it 30% the cost to reach the same number of people? Oh. I, I was like, oh. Well, this is great. Can we write up a case study? And they were like, yeah, yeah, in the new year, we'll write up a case study. So th this is the kind of thing that you can do if you target yourself. If not, you know, Google and Facebook are really happy to take that money. So I, mean, I, can, I can see how you can certainly use uh, audience research to better define what kind of publications your target audience are likely to engage with and perhaps actually take full control over that um, advertising relationship yourself. Can you also use decent, high-quality audience research to better put together your Google Ads campaigns, better put together your LinkedIn advertising campaigns? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what this, this agency that emailed me on Friday was saying, right? That they essentially, okay, wow. had, I think in their case, it was LinkedIn and Twitter that they had done it specifically with. So they had basically said, hey, rather than just letting these services do the targeting for us or use our own intuition around it, we're going to actually go collect data and, you know, okay, it looks like 19% of the audience that we want to reach who have this particular job title follow these publications or follow these social accounts. So our Twitter ad campaign is going to be, hey, show this ad to people who follow these Twitter accounts, you know, or go to LinkedIn, do the same thing with the job titles or people who use a hashtag or people who follow a particular group. So those sorts of targeting in the, in the advertising world can help you potentially do better with your ad ROI results. But for me, David, the, the advertising side is interesting, but it's not my passion. Like that's not, that's not what I look for, right? What, when I get, you know, whatever, an update from SparkToro and it says, hey, you're, you know, the audience that follows you or the audience that follows us has changed in this particular way and they're using this new hashtag or they're following this new social account or they're visiting this new website. I like to reach out direct and make a connection of some kind and find some way for us to co-market or work together. I want to find a way for that channel or service to amplify me without exchanging dollars. I don't go to, you know, oh, hey, this new... LinkedIn, this new person on LinkedIn is like really popular among the audience I want to reach. I don't want, I don't want to pay them. I want to do something with them. I want to find some way that we can collectively add value to their audience. That's going to get them, get me in front of their audience, get SparkTor in front of their audience. That's really what I use the service for. So organic and paid. You talked about an audience changing. How often does an audience change? How often do you actually have to conduct audience research? Because I guess some brands would think, okay, we're making a play into this market, we're launching this new product or service, we'll conduct our audience research. Once it's done, it's done. But is that a big mistake? Not necessarily. Like I, I, I think there are use cases where a big piece of audience research to try and understand a market and then do you know, product development and a, a channel strategy and marketing mix strategy, all those kinds of things. Makes total sense, right? You don't want to redo your whatever, your branding and positioning on a regular basis. No, you <laughs> hopefully branding and positioning is something that you establish once and maybe you fine tune every year or two or three. But in terms of specific tactics, what hashtags are we going to use for our social posts this week? I mean, I would highly recommend that you use the ones that are trending with your audience, right? That, that your audience is actually paying attention to, the ones that they're using. You should probably go in and look at those hashtags that they're using week over week and see what topics they're talking about so you know what to put
put in your blog or who's trending so you can invite them on your podcast or bring them to your webinar or put them at your conference or event or work with them on a co-marketing pitch. All of those kinds of things change technically every day. The way, you know, I think a big point of frustration is, uh, and, and, you know, you sort of brought this up in the question, David, but big point of frustration for sure is having to go back through the process of audience research each time. That is very frustrating. I will agree that that is sometimes such a pain that it's not worthwhile. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that we, that we tried to do with Spark Tour, we, I think you probably saw this last week, but we did this, you know, um, audience tracking update. So now you can say, I always care about whatever, the audience that uses the hashtag packaging design or the audience that frequently talks about drones or the audience that follows, you know, at Ranfish on Twitter. And then every week, SparkTor will just tell you everything that's changed with that audience and sort of give you a little summary in an email uh, every seven days. And I, I think that that's a much smarter way to go, right? Get automatic alerts. I do this with BuzzSumo. Like a lot of people do this with um, with mentions. Google Alerts, right? Google Alerts mm -hmm. is telling you what's changing. Like what? when are people talking about you or your brand and mentioning you on the web? It's the same kind of thing, right? It's that passive intelligence of what's what's in the conversation, what's in the zeitgeist, what's going on with my audience. So when you mentioned Google Alerts there, I was thinking, when was the last time I've actually logged into Google Alerts? I used to use it an awful lot, but it doesn't seem to be that. Oh, but it's so bad. Have you have you tried in the last few years? Like it is, I, I swear to God, they have like some engineer in a basement somewhere and 10% of that person's job is like checking to make sure Google Alerts is still alive. But it barely works. It's awful. This is why I use Buzz, BuzzSumo. So when a marketer first, I guess, tries SparkToro, what kind of platforms, if any, do you find that they're actively using at the moment? Do you find that uh, brands are a bit piggity-piggity when it comes to audience research and they don't necessarily have a fixed way of doing it and it's all about just what the marketer feels like at the day or or do brands typically have a certain way they do uh, audience research that you can say a lot of companies do it this way um first off i want to recognize your genius use of the phrase higgledy piggledy which we don't have in the united states but i would like for us to adopt and steal it sounds delightful uh and second what i find is that no two companies are the same no two agencies even are the same. I don't think, I think this is one of those rare areas uh, in marketing where there's no best practice. So, you know, you can find, I think the, <laughs> the most common uh, one that is standardized is folks who build personas uh, and they tend to build marketing and product personas and they keep those on a wall with you know, sort of a cartoon illustration of a person who has an alliterative name and has three and a half dogs and two cats and six and a half children and likes their Starbucks latte with cream. But I don't think that's a particularly useful or valuable insight into audience research. I don't think it's a great way to do it. My recommendation is that you change up that process if you've got it. What I do find is everyone does it differently, but that's okay. I know that sounds kind of odd. It's not that there isn't a best practice. What I think is true is, unlike many other forms of marketing, it is so uh, crucial to cater the research that you do to the problems you actually have to solve that I don't like, I really don't like, David, when people give advice, even other audience research professionals, market research professionals, where they say, hey, you need to follow these 10 steps. You need to get these pieces of information. Because for me, it's kind of a, why? Why are you getting those pieces of information? If you don't have a great answer to that question, like, oh, well, if we know which podcasts our audience is listening to and how that's changed over time, we will do this marketing tactic differently. If you don't have a good answer to that, don't collect the data. It's not going to be helpful to you. It's a waste of your time and energy. So I would start from the position of, what do I need in my marketing to do better targeting? to better understand my customers, to better understand the people who amplify messages to my customers, to better understand which messages resonate with them and where, and then take those questions and use audience research to solve them. Well, for my US friends, Higwuti Pigwuti means in a confused, disordered, or random manner. That's oh, the yeah, that's dictionary it. definition. There we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, so politics then. Politics. <laughs> 
<laughs> at least our there politics, we go. I don't know. It's, maybe maybe the UK has very sane and boring politics. Is that? Uh, do you, do you think so? Is that is that what you you're seeing on the the news at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the Rand Trolls David show will be back in a few minutes after our sponsor, the Queen. <laughs> and um, we had a brief conversation beforehand, dear listener, dear viewer, to say, um, um, I, I said to Rand, Rand, any conversation that I have to you, it, it, uh, normally it's, um, oh, it should be about 20 minutes or so, but normally it ends up being five hours. <laughs> Please, can, can we, <laughs> that was detour number, no, we're not going to go down that detour. Look at me being responsible. I'm being so responsible. I'm going to say that um, you also shared with me, well, you shared with me at the beginning of the discussion to say that um, a marketing agency informed you that um, they had a significant percentage decrease in their cost to acquire customers based upon the audience research. I think you said 30 or, or 40%. Yeah, they, they told me 30%, 30% of right. the cost um, of, what they, of what they were doing before. So articulating a financial value to audience research will, will certainly get heads turned internally in terms of why you should do it. And a case study that you also mentioned to me beforehand was a brand called Comprehensive.io. Um, that's an online B2B service that helps to ensure that compensation decisions uh, are fair and equitable. And they recently managed to appear in TechCrunch. And you did a, a little bit of um, research to show that 41.6% of their target audience engages with that particular publication. Which is slightly surprising to me, right? TechCrunch is a popular publication, but when I think of who reads it, I tend to think of tech entrepreneurs and insiders, and I oftentimes venture capitalists and investors, those types of folks. I, to be frank, I do not think of HR professionals when I think about TechCrunch. But apparently, if you are in tech HR, TechCrunch is a very popular publication. I think it was one of the top three most uh, subscribed to or followed publications that we have in our index, which means that if you want to reach HR professionals in tech and you have a product for them, it's a great idea to get covered in TechCrunch. And you probably should go through the effort of trying to do a PR pitch and you know getting whatever your new product covered in that publication. I think that Data like that is hard to come by. It's difficult to ask your audience, hey, can you tell me all the publications that you subscribe to? And then try and put together a sophisticated analysis of that. And very often, if you ask HR professionals, they will focus on you know, some recent, recent ones that they read. They'll focus on the ones that they think they're supposed to read that are more popular uh, rather than sort of, hey, here's my phone, just go through all, everything I've done in the last week. Um, and that, uh, you know, that passive collection of data can help solve that. So TechCrunch, big popular publication, everybody knows about it. But I was helping someone, I mentioned that packaging design, David. Mm -hmm. I was helping someone in Europe, uh, in Italy, actually, who, who works in packaging design for, uh, it's kind of for agricultural and food processing equipment. So weird, boring industry. Anyway, I didn't know anything about that field, but we looked in, we looked up people whose uh, professional bio included the words packaging design, found all these publications, conferences and events, which apparently is, is big in Europe for, for that group. And then that is where they did their outreach and targeting and, and got some placement. Uh, I think it was Rabo Research. I, I did a, an example of them uh, appearing in a bunch of these places. I mean, what, what's cool about this is you don't have to know a whole lot about the field, right? You can just go in and say, well, who are you trying to reach? Okay, I can tell you where to reach them. And that's data that Facebook and Google, they have, they know it, but they will not tell you. One thing that I also took from what you were saying there is actually focus on the passions of your audience, not necessarily content behind what it is that you do or what you're trying to sell. But if you can engage with them at the point where they're engaged, they're motivated, they're loving what they're reading, and then perhaps you can consume with them at the same time. It reminds me of the story of uh, attorneys in the States, actually, that they decided to research their audience. And because they researched their audience, and also because they knew that their service was the type of service that people only used every four or five years or so, uh, they decided to start a podcast on golf. And that's what the majority of their audience absolutely loved to do. But it was a reminder of the fact that their brand existed. So when their target audience was ready to buy, then they'd remember the brand. I love those 
sort of random affinities, affinities that you wouldn't ordinarily find. I have no you know, doubt that they did this in some other fashion, but I was looking up, I saw the uh, crossover that, you know how Lego will work with whatever, Sony to do a Spider-Man set or, or Marvel to do a Thor set or stuff like this, right? So Lego will do these, these collaboration crossovers. I saw they did one recently with uh, the Dungeons and Dragons brand, which is based here in Seattle. We have the, the offices for the company that, that owns and runs Dungeons and Dragons here. And you can see in Spark Toro the overlap that we have this like Venn diagram thing that you can do if you compare two audiences. And the overlap of people who follow one of Lego's social accounts and follow one of Dungeons and Dragons social accounts is very high. And so I, I thought to myself, like, my God, this is a, this is a genius marketing move. Right, it's a product marketing move. They're not choosing where to, you know, target an audience or a hashtag to use or content to create. They're choosing a product to design and a collaborative effort to engage in. And you know, the data bears out that this is a very smart idea, and they probably have a a lot of crossover fans uh, to be able to engage with that. And I think that it's those kinds of interesting connections that you would otherwise be unable to surface. That, uh, that make audience research so valuable. All the kinds of audience research, right? Not, I'm not just talking about the passively collected stuff from SparkToro, like interviews and surveys. That It wouldn't surprise me if a survey or an interview was exactly how Lego found that a bunch of their fans were also fans of D&D. Yeah, and um, it almost reminds me of the reverse unicorn ad strategy by Larry Kim. And if Lego had advertised on Facebook, I know you Probably not a great fan of doing that, but um, if they'd advertised on Facebook um, Lego and Dungeons and Dragons, the community that were passionate about both brands would have been highly likely to engage with that campaign. Yeah, I mean, and one of the interesting things, so you, before the 2016 election and the Cambridge Analytica scandal, you used to be able to go into Facebook and you could select, you remember, you could select in Facebook's audience builder at an audience uh you know, that had some particular attribute and then see how big the audience would be if you added another dimension onto them. So similar kind of to what you could today do in SparkTor, you could do in Facebook ads. Um, and of course, they, they took this away because of, you know, they say privacy. I, I think probably they, they had concerns that people would be able to use it in problematic ways, which maybe is fair. But that's um, something that I think is ludicrously valuable. Well, let's move on from what works now to planning for the future. So in your opinion, what's the biggest marketing trend or challenge for marketers over the coming year? Yeah, so I, I think we are entering, have entered and are continuing to enter a period of uh, attribution going away for virtually all organic channels. And I think attribution today only really exists for paid channels. And it's so incredibly difficult, so complex, and so rough in terms of the measurement that I, I would suggest that most people don't even bother unless you're sort of doing $100 million a year in revenue or more. I would say you shouldn't even bother trying to build attribution models for organic. They're going to be so, so off that it won't help you. And instead, we're getting back to a world that's a little bit, David, like what the 20th century's measurement systems looked like. So, you know, if Coca-Cola ran an ad in 1955, the way they would do it is they'd run it in Cleveland, Ohio, but not in Cincinnati. And then they'd look at same store sales from Cleveland and Cincinnati. And if those sales were exactly the same and they didn't change or they were within margin of error, they, they'd say, OK, the ad didn't work. That was an ineffective ad. Let's run something else. And if it did, right, if Cleveland's, you know, same source sales rose and Cincinnati's didn't, they'd say, all right, take that ad, run it all over Ohio. We're going to test Ohio against Kansas, right? And, and this would be how advertising measurement was done, marketing measurement was done. And today, I think we're going back to that world where you sort of have to make investments, measure broad lift, and then try and say, okay, our campaign of, you know, whatever, content marketing or social media marketing or podcasting or building up our YouTube channel or trying to get our brand out through, through conferences and events, all these organic kinds of things, the way to measure it is with broad brand lift, 
direct and type in traffic, branded search traffic. I, I wrote a long blog post about this for people who are interested in like the actual process of measurement versus attribution and why this is going on. But this, I think, is a, a huge trend. And you're going to see, you know, I just saw the report this morning, right, that Salesforce feels like because of the macroeconomic environment, because of the uh, challenges of measurement, they don't think they can make a forecast for next year. They just, it's too difficult. So we're not going to forecast our financial quarterly results like we usually do. I think that's going to be true for a lot of folks who who don't just rely on paid, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of um, big public companies are certainly struggling to um, to stick with the the story that they're, they thought were going to happen because um, you just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it could be a mild recession next year. It could be a deep recession. It could be even no recession at all. There's, it's, it's so hard to predict. It, it is weird. Like we, I feel like for four quarters, we've been waiting for a recession. Mm, exactly. <laughs> it's been this like this holding pattern. It's very, uh, part of me wants to just, okay, consumers just stop spending or never stop spending and just tell us. <laughs> but, but of course, the consumer behavior being impossible to predict, you don't know. I've been your host, David Bain. You can find Ran Fishkin and the blog post that he mentions over at sparktoro.com. Ran, thanks so much for being on the Strategic Marketing Show. My pleasure, David. Thank you again for having me. And thank you for listening. Here at IFP, our goal is simple. To connect you with the most relevant information to help solve your business problems all in one place. InsightsforProfessionals.com <laughs>